Good evening, family of the Most High God. Welcome to our prayer session for tonight. Glory be to God. We are rounding up our teaching on the kingdom mindset. Glory be to God. Let us pray. Father Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for every word that you've given us, a waiting season, a waiting time word of empowerment. Thank you for assessing us and finding the appropriate word to lift us up from a place where we are weak and unable to attain what you want us to attain and provide the appropriate word that lifts us to a position of glory, a position of power, a position of authority, a position where we enjoy the comforts that you have for us. In Jesus Christ's mighty name. Where we've lost it, Father, where we've missed the mark, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, wash us clean with the blood of Jesus, and restore us to righteousness. We also ask you to renew our minds and restore us to the position of excellent soul. And on our part, we forgive everyone's ever wronged us, everyone's ever sinned against us, because our hearts are supposed to be free and they belong to you. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, we pray. Thank you, Father Lord. Holy Spirit, we once again look up to you for the division of the word in chunks we can understand, chunks we can process, chunks we can mix of the faith and profit out of the word. In Jesus Christ, my name we pray. Thank you, Father Lord. Amen. Glory be to God. Our reading comes from Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. This has spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again he sent out the other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat and livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and they went their way, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest sized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Glory be to God. Now in this parable, Christ is preaching universalism. He's preaching the concept that Jehovah has for the kingdom. Universalism basically speaks of the belief that humankind will eventually be saved. Which means the kingdom that was being set up by Christ was meant to take everyone in. Not just a few chosen ones, but everyone in. That's why we find out that the slaves were sent first to invite the ones who had been invited in. The first ones who had been called in to attend the wedding. And the king sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, but they were unwilling to come. So, this basically shows the part where Abraham was asked to teach his descendants the ways of the Lord so they can be the first ones into the kingdom of the Father. And the entrance of the kingdom of the Father was through Christ, but 
they rejected Christ. So these were the ones who were unwilling to come into the kingdom that came with Christ, the kingdom of heaven. And a number of times Jehovah had sent his prophets to rebuke them, to teach them with his ways. But you find some of them were murdered by the people. You know, the persecution of uh, the disciples after the crucifixion of Christ was not the first time the children of Israel killed messengers of the Lord. A number of prophets had been killed over the period of time since the creation of the kingdom of Israel. And they've been killing a lot of prophets along the way to the point where they killed Christ and went on to kill the disciples who were apostles who were preaching the gospel. But Christ is foretelling what was going to happen. That after you have rejected me, the king in heaven is going to send more slaves to go and invite everyone according to the prophecy given to Abraham that through your seed all nations shall be blessed. So we see we being those who were now being called from the streets because we are not part of the old covenant. The new covenant that came after the rejection of Christ even though the rejection did not mean that they were the only ones invited because Christ speaks of other sheep that were not in the pen that he wanted to bring in, meaning us. So we see us being them that are invited into the kingdom after Christ was rejected by the children of Israel. And this is a unique place because the invitation means the moment the banquet starts, the normal place where everyone else could go and do their business stops being a place where you can do your business. You see, before the banquet, the invitees could go to their farms, could go to their businesses. But we hear when the banquet starts, that outside becomes a treacherous place where there's whooping a nation of teeth. So we are being told that as much as the world still looks like it's a normal place that you can be, when the banquet starts, that becomes the worst place you can ever find yourself because you'll be destined for problems if you are not in the kingdom when the banquet starts. And one thing that we need to recognize is being called and rejecting the call by the Lord is not just unique to them that way invited first. A lot of people have been invited in the kingdom have rejected. I have two accounts where well, I tried to invite them on my own and they rejected to come into the kingdom. And their rejection, whether it's out of ignorance or just dislike of Christ, they are all destined for the same fate as the ones who are not in the kingdom. And it is up to us to see to it that our family and friends are invited in the kingdom before time so that they are safe from the calamities that come from being out in the darkness. And something that we need to understand is these people were invited and they were in the banquet, but somehow when they were in the kingdom thinking that it is done, some were found to be unworthy even when they were invited in the kingdom. That should make you understand how you should be standing because being clothed for the wedding means, for the banquet means you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So if you are invited and you are not serious about grace, about the righteousness that comes through Christ, and you still believe you can go in the kingdom by your works, that even when you are in the kingdom, you disregard the grace that comes through Christ and you want to go your own way, you want to present yourself as a righteous individual, you might be found to be not in the right clothing and that could be a challenge. So we are encouraged to maintain the righteousness that comes through Christ all the way through until the coming of the Lord. We need to be very much a little of this. For something to note is the invited had ridiculous 
answers. They did weird things with being invited to a party where the dinner is prepared. The oxen that fit in livestock have been butchered. It's not bring and bride. You are being told just come and enjoy and they refuse. They chose to go and work for their provisions. In fact, they've been called the provisions are here. One chooses to go to go and work in the field. That's choosing to enter the kingdom by works. Rather than choose to go and do his business, that's choosing to enter the kingdom by works. So it does not make sense that Christ did all the works. You just need to come in and enjoy what Jehovah has prepared for you. But I don't still believe they can show the Lord that they are righteous individuals and they want to go through by works in the kingdom. We hear Christ is the only way. And if you are not with Christ, you have not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then we have a problem for you. Because when the king comes, problems are big for them that are not in the kingdom. And something to note is the king gave a wedding feast for his son. The king made a wedding feast for his son. So the presence into the feast is to be on allegiances to the son. We need to remember that. There has to be an allegiance to the son. That's why we are called the bride of Christ. Because the marriage that comes with our relations with Jehovah means we get to be provided for by the father. We have to be provided for in the kingdom. And it is to our advantage to recognize the unique position that we occupy. And it would be very unfortunate to miss out on such an opportunity because even Paul says, I don't want to preach the gospel and be disqualified at the end because he knows what is coming is really something very important. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When even came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, this last man have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I'm generous? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Glory be to God. Uh, this parable is very exciting because it speaks of the importance of Jehovah as the creator with final authority in connection of rewards and he say i have the utmost gift that i want to give to them that have saved me 
and it is the kingdom. You understand? The kingdom has to be as it is for everyone who gets in. If you are getting in today, you are still getting into the kingdom. It does not change because you came in today. It is the same as them that went to the kingdom 10 years before you. They are still going to benefit from the gift that Jehovah has for his children because the same law that applied to the one who got in today is the same law that applies to them that got in way after. Glory be to God. So we know that when we go in, we should not try and expect a kingdom different from the kingdom of everyone else called in because it is a kingdom. If it was a religion, then there could be differences in what we can receive. But because it is a kingdom, everything that is provided for us is the same in the kingdom. The Father is the provider. Say, ask and shall receive. She means if you go in the kingdom today and you have faith, the substance of things hopeful, you can still ask and receive. That's why you find in situations where the people who have been in church for 10, 15 years and they're still sick with the disease that they came in church 15 years ago. And then somebody comes in today and they're delivered and they're healed the same day because the same king works with the same law that governs whoever was there earlier or whoever got in now because it's an issue of faith. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. If I have more faith and I ask and receive, I will not be discounted from receiving because I got in today. I will receive because I have faith. You understand? So we are encouraged to operate at the highest level of understanding that we should not expect something different from a kingdom because the highest reward that we're being given is the kingdom that is better than anything else that is available. Because, you see, the people that are being hired were idols. They were not earning anything. They were in a place where their value was not appreciated. As much as something could be driven out of them, they could do something to be rewarded. They were doing nothing. There was no reward. And the engagement into the vineyard made them be able to show the value that they took in. And whether they worked the full day or half a day, the value is still the same because you are all children of the Most High God. Whether you became a child 10 years ago or a child today, you are still a child of the Lord. There's something that we need to understand also, that He is our Father, Jehovah is our Father. And when He gives inheritance, He does not say, because you were born yesterday, you are receiving nothing in terms of inheritance. If he chooses to share his inheritance from the old to the young, he has the right to give every one of the children the same value to a toddler who can't spell his own name, to a graduate who has 10 masters. The father can give the same gift as he chooses because he is the supreme ruler of the kingdom. He chooses what he wants to give and is giving us a sneak view on how he rewards his children. The big picture that we need to see is you are taken away from a place of lack into a place of provision. That's what we need to see. From a place where you are not valuable to a place where you are valued. That's the first thing we need to understand. Without being cold, you are there in the cold way. You are not useful in any way. And when you are cold, you have something to do in the kingdom of the Father. And the reward is the benefits of the kingdom, and we glorify the Lord who chooses to bless us very much and gives us the good gift that we enjoy in the mighty name of Jesus. Glory be to God. We'll try to rush in and run up on the parables concerning the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God to just give us what Christ is talking about because most of them give a similar meaning but just an in-depth point of view that should alert us to what we should expect in the kingdom of the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said unto him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to 70 times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to 70 times, but up to 70 times 7. 
For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had began to settle them, one who had owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay everything. And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and went and reported to their Lord all that had happened. He then, summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you, have, should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over, to the torturers until he should pay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So in this parable, Christ is teaching us the importance of forgiveness. We are not to hold grudges. This is important teaching. We are not to hold grudges. We're supposed to forgive those who wronged us. Just as Christ has forgiven us. Just as the Father has forgiven us. It is very important. I have prayed with people who have been unable to receive their healing because they are not able to forgive people who wronged them. They've used the anger as a crush to be mean to the people who had wronged them. They've used it as a reason to be unfriendly to people because, well, people are bad. That's one of the reasons that we don't get. We always get. They've done this. When you're preaching to them, they are not willing to listen to what is being preached concerning forgiveness. They are looking for reasons to justify their hatred or their anger or the unforgiveness of others. And this is what not is encouraged in the kingdom of the Lord because you will not be a lot of people I've prayed with have missed out on what they're supposed to receive because in the process of counseling, praying for them, they insist on explaining why they are angry, when explaining why they shouldn't be kind to the person who has wronged them because most cases when the Holy Spirit is working in someone who is under oppression, there's always an enemy who has put negativity in people's hearts and is using that negativity to rob you in those problems that are surrounding you. And because the hatred and the anger and the unforgiveness has been built in as a stronghold, a lot of people struggle to receive the gifts of the Lord because of that. I can remember counseling a man for more than an hour trying to tell him that what you are stuck in right now is a problem of your own making because you are unable to forgive your spouse. And he had all sorts of reasons. And the Holy Spirit told him, unforgiveness does not mean there are no reasons to not forgive. Unforgiveness means you know there are reasons for you to be angry. You know there are reasons for you not to forgive. But despite those reasons existing, you forgive that person. We went on for more than an hour until the Holy Spirit said, told him blindly, your problems will persist until you forgive your spouse. 
until you choose to take my word as spoken in the Bible, as written in the Bible, and throw away the anger that you have, the risk that you have for not forgiving your spouse, and the attachment that you have to the material wealth that you are using as a reason not to forgive your spouse. After some time, he came back realizing he needed help. And from the day that he forgave his spouse and let go of the quarrels that they had on material things, the Lord came and blessed the man in a manner because he was given a prophecy. If you let go of the anger that you have towards your spouse, of the fight that you do have for the material things that you have been using with your spouse, you will be given new things. And Jehovah, as a, as a faithful God, kept his word. As long as the man held on to his unforgiveness, there was nothing happening in the man's life. But the moment he forgave his spouse, his business picked. He started having new deals, new opportunities, and his wealth grew to the point where everything that he had given away to his spouse was replaced with brand new things because Jehovah had blessed him. So I, this is something that we need to learn as children of the Lord that most of the times we lose on the blessings of the Lord because we are holding on to anger, frustrations, material things as justification for putting negativity in our hearts and in the process we are missing out on the blessings of the Lord that make it rich and add no sorrows. A lot of people suffer from a lot of disease not because the power of the Lord is not there but they've entertained anger, they've entertained frustration and they are holding on to that anger and frustration and it's not helping them. Today we are being encouraged to loosen our grip on unforgiveness. As long as there's unforgiveness in you, you cannot receive the good things of the Lord. And it is very important to realize that even in the Lord's Prayer, we are encouraged to forgive others because Jehovah has forgiven us. So if the Lord's Prayer has got such a statement, this Christ speaking about this, and he's in, encouraging us not to mix anger with our faith, unforgiveness with our faith, then we are missing out on what's supposed to be done and we need to understand this is very important. In the kingdom, there's no room for unforgiveness. In the kingdom, there's no room for anger. In the kingdom, there's no room for negativity because Jehovah is our God and he cares for us and he wants everything to be good for us. Glory be to God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as this. Let the children alone. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as this. And we had a teaching on this, this scripture. But as a recap, Christ is saying, the kingdom of heaven is not just for adults. First, everyone is invited Universalism means everyone is invited. Any race, any creed, any tribe, any age. There is no division of them that are eligible to be in the kingdom. You can come in and be in the kingdom despite being a toddler, being small, because they accept the kingdom without question. We are expected to accept the kingdom without question and walk in and enjoy what Jehovah has prepared for us because Christ is saying the kingdom of heaven is like a banquet. You know, a banquet prepared by the king who created heaven and earth. That's a good place to be because he's speaking of food. He's saying the fattened livestock has been killed. The dinner has been prepared, which means provisions, the comforts that we need are provided by our God of comfort, the God of comforts. He is a specialist at giving good gifts to them that he loves. He's good at providing for all of us. He created us differently and has given us everything that we desire. And we know when we are being invited to go and enjoy the comforts, it is as good as he says it is. And glory be to God, it is an environment where there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no demons. It's as good as Jehovah says it is. So, 
we can as well become children and enter that kingdom because we do a lot to get into places that cannot be compared to what Jehovah is inviting us to be. Some get crash parties where they're not invited. Some go to places where it's really a bit of a shame if people see you there and they make an effort. Now there's a good place to go into. Let's go and join in the kingdom of the Father because it's a good place for us to be there. And we need to make sure that what Jehovah has given us is very important and we get to do that. Glory be to God. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 to 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Glory be to God. I know this scripture has been uh, a challenge for many people that they think Jehovah wants everyone to be poor so that they can go in the kingdom of the Lord. But the gospel is actually meant to move you out of poverty into abundance. And Christ says, I came to give you abundance, a life in abundance, full and overflow, which means Christ is not against abundance. It's what happens when you have the abundance what matters. Because something to note here is saying, it is easier for a camel to go through. Maybe to give a bit of a background, the eye of a needle is not the needle that women use to sew clothes. The eye of a needle was a small gate that is normally put next to the big gate in kingdoms. It was a gate where men walk in. You know, when the gate is closed, let's say in the night, where traffic is not allowed in the kingdom, there's always a small gate where citizens can go through, but you cannot go through that with a lot of luggage, a lot of merchandise. So Christ was saying, it is easier for a camel to go through that little door than for a rich man to go into heaven. It is still possible to squeeze in that knee, and it's a lot of work to do that because your camel might get hit going through. It's a tight squeeze for a camel to get through. That's what Christ is saying. It is very difficult and hard. It's a lot of work to get that to happen. And we are being told something here that is important. The reason, if we go in the context of these teachings, the rich man had chosen his wealth over Christ. That's why it was difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom. But, because when you look at the disciples, they had employees, which means they were business people. Although their business were not as glamorous as we would look at them, but they were people with wealth. They had positions because they were running businesses, they had employees, they had partners. Which means they had an enterprise of some sort that was running. And we know they were providing the step of food to the market, which means they had a market for their product. I mean, they were not people really struggling. That's why they were saying, who shall be saved if this man can't enter the kingdom and we left everything? Now, if we left our world now, who shall be saved? Then Christ says, with men, it is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible because you... You left your wealth. You already qualified because you chose me over your wealth. If you are wealthy and you choose to love your wealth more than Jehovah, it's a bit of a problem for you to get in the kingdom because Jehovah comes first. Love the Lord your God, not your money, not your wealth, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, for the first three things to love, money and wealth are not considered. They are not considered, which means you cannot make your own law and says, I'll love the money first and then love Jehovah next and expect yourself to gain the kingdom. It does not work that way. So we are encouraged to make sure that when you have been blessed by the Lord, let your trust be in Jehovah. Let Jehovah be your gold, be your peace, be your joy, be your everything. Despite you being very worthy, you still walk by faith and not by sight. You should trust in him, not in your money. You should trust him, not in your wealth. That's what we'll be encouraged here. Because that wealth is required for use in heaven. If you are to use that wealth to be a blessing, Jehovah says, you'll be given to you, praise, shake and good measure. Why? Because you are not a greedy individual. You're not screwed. When you're asked to help by Jehovah, you choose to obey Jehovah and not 
the words of Mammon saying, I want to stay with you, don't give me away. So we are being encouraged to make sure that when we are blessed in the kingdom of the Lord, we maintain the love of the Lord. We maintain our trust in the Lord. We continue praying. We continue praying without ceasing. We continue trusting Him. We continue listening to Him. Because even if He says, go and give everything that you have to the poor, you do it because you choose Jehovah, because He's your God, He's your treasure. That's why we are being encouraged here. And we are being encouraged not to be lovers of money because the love of money is the beginning of evil. That's what the Bible tells us. So we're supposed to love the Lord our God first and then love ourselves just as we love the neighbors. That's how we work. And in terms of love, we don't hear the love of goats and cows and livestock. No, no. We are supposed to love the Lord our God. And we are expected to trust in Him who loves us because He has blessed us with all men our spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Glory be to God. The teachings that Christ has given us are very particular because he is saying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Why is he saying the kingdom of God over and over? Because that's what he came to teach us. That's what he came to teach us. He came to teach us about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we cannot miss it. We cannot be confused about what Jehovah wants. There are 21 verses that Christ says the kingdom of heaven is like. Not just the way the word the kingdom of heaven is called. No, 21 teachings on the kingdom of heaven. And we need to make sure that we maintain that understanding that this is something very serious. 21 times Christ was teaching us concerning the kingdom. 21 times he was teaching continuously. He was teaching. And we need to make sure that we focus on those teachings because we are in the kingdom. And if we're in the kingdom, the best way for us to benefit from what is in the kingdom is to know about the kingdom. The best way not to lose our position in the kingdom is to know about the kingdom. The best way to ensure that we do not lose the rest after preaching the gospel to everyone else is to know about the kingdom. So I implore you, my brothers and sisters, to go and look for those scriptures that Christ taught about the kingdom of heaven. I can give you the list of them. Matthew chapter 18 verse 3, Matthew chapter 19 verse 23, Matthew 16 verse 19, Mark chapter 4 verse 26 to 29, Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 to 46, Matthew chapter 13 verse 31 to 43, Matthew chapter 13 verse 47 to 52, Matthew chapter 25 verse 14 to 13, Matthew chapter 25 verse 1 to 13, Matthew chapter 22 verse 1 to 14, Matthew chapter 13 verse 24 to 30, Matthew chapter 20 verse 1 to 16. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. And Luke chapter 8, verse 10. Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. Mark chapter 10, verse 14. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 to 24. Mark chapter 10, verse 23. Luke chapter 18, verse 29 to 30. Mark chapter 4, verse 30 to 34. If you go through these scriptures, get to understand more, talk with the Holy Spirit, because He has more to share with you. The one hour that we get to teach is not enough for you to get the full revelation of the kingdom of heaven, but the Holy Spirit who is there to teach you will be able to enlighten you more concerning the kingdom of heaven. So I implore you to ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation knowledge. You go through those verses one after another, pray about it, read them slowly and attentively, not just rush through and finish them, because this is all about what Christ came to give us. And if we miss this, we are as well, just like the Pharisees, we have the word and no knowledge. So we are expected to receive this word. This, these teachings are very important because they are the chance for you to live with what Jehovah is for you. They are a chance for you 
to be knowledgeable of what Jehovah has for you and you can able to pass that knowledge to your children so that you are able to transfer the words that you have to your children with the knowledge that we have. It is very important for us to be fully conversant with what Christ was teaching us and we should not miss this. If you can research, you can find commentaries concerning these chapters, these verses, go and do that so that you are fully knowledgeable about the kingdom where you belong. Because lack of knowledge of where you belong is disastrous because the Bible tells us that we perish because we lack knowledge. And we've been given an opportunity, a study pack for us, the verses to go through. And if you have forgotten to write them or didn't have the time to write them, this teaching will be available on YouTube. You go and listen and put down those verses and make sure you learn them because they are very important. I implore you to focus on this than anything else because those are the teachings that can make you live the life in abundant full and overflow because they position you to benefit from what jehovah has for you so i want you my brothers and sisters to take this very serious and learn as much as you can and this concludes our teaching on the kingdom mindset and this is my hope that after going through all the 14 volumes you have a better understanding of the kingdom where you belong and why you are encouraged to see yourself as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and not as a religious individual worshipping a religious god. No. You are in a kingdom where Jehovah operates using his laws and is governed by his laws and when you know the laws you can implement them in your life because some of the laws they have qualifying factors for receiving and we need to know all those things so i thank you so much for being patient enough to listen to all these teachings and be put in a position where you can benefit from what jehovah has prepared for you these 14 volumes just don't listen to them once Listen to them twice, listen to them three times, four times, over a period of time so that you are fully knowledgeable with this. I, for one, I've been listening to the teachings and every night I listen to a teaching or two and they have been helping me a lot because there are new things that I get to realize were spoken by the Holy Spirit that I did not know were there, even though I was present and I was talking through the whole period of the preaching. So I would want us to go through those teachings over and over because it is the wisdom that we receive. It is the difference between failure and success. It's the difference between sickness and health. It's the difference between living a mediocre life and living a life in abundance to the full and overflow. Thank you so much for being with us in this teaching. But before we close, let us pray. Father, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this series of teachings that you've given us. A teaching that is given to us to alert us of why we are here, what we need to do, and how we need to do what needs to be done in the kingdom that you've invited us to be in. These teachings have framed our minds to work with you, to receive what you're supposed to receive. And we thank you for the miracles that are happening within our prayer group where them that have been obedient to you have been working doing the works that have instructed we thank you jehovah for the miracle of deliverance that was done by sister tendai today a miracle that shows authority and dominion for she confessed that she is in the kingdom and she has dominion and through that confession she had power over spirits that were commending them that required deliverance and deliverance was done. We thank you, Lord Jehovah, that these teachings have framed our minds for the works that you want us to do. For we are in the kingdom to serve you, Lord, in Jesus Christ's mighty name. We thank you, Father, Lord Jehovah, for what you have done for us. And we look forward to more teachings that frame us to work with you, to benefit from every word you've given us, for the wisdom that you've given us, Father. Has transformed our lives and we are better than we were before. Even though we are not yet perfect yet, we know the more we learn from you, the better we become in Jesus Christ's mighty name. As we go to sleep, Father, we ask you to bless us the comfortable night. No nightmares, no tossing, no turning. And may the army of the kingdom of heaven protect us, the citizens of heaven, from all enemies that want to attack us in our sleep. And may we continuously rely on your protection as your children 
In Jesus Christ's mighty name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters, for coming into our prayer session. And I'm very happy to share with you that the people who received the gifts in our prayer meetings have been saving the Lord. They've been bringing souls to the kingdom. They've been praying for the sick and they've been healed. They've been dealing with demons who are possessing people, helping them that are lost find their way to the Lord. I would like to encourage every one of us to desire those spiritual gifts that come through the Holy Spirit because He can give you those gifts as He chose to give them that they've received these gifts and have been serving the Lord. Paul says, desire the gift of prophecy. If you desire the gift of prophecy, you can ask and you can receive. So we hope to have more of you sent into ministry to assist them that are lost because this is a prayer group where we are taught to be servants of the Lord and not sheep that need to be led by other men. But we are being taught to be led by Christ himself. So this is an empowerment group where we are supposed to serve Jehovah as he directs us. Not serve Jehovah through men, but serve Jehovah as he directs us because the Holy Spirit was in you has been sent to abide in you, to teach you, to guide you, and to comfort you. And glory be to God, the fruits of the Holy Spirit shall manifest in every one of us as we desire them in the mighty name of Jesus. We love you so much. We hope to see you tomorrow at the same time where we receive a waiting season, a waiting time, a word of empowerment. Good night and bye-bye.